Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You covered quite a bit. Um, and I want to start with what stood out for you. You talked about Mary and her indigenous chicken. You talked about the progress in McQuinney County. But what's the one thing you, that stood out for you on this visit? You've been here for three days, meeting all sorts of people. You told us about that. But what's the one thing that you're taking away from you, uh, from here? Well, it's been a, a three-day visit. Uh, you know, I got to see the uh, Camry, uh, which is uh, incredible medical research going on there to understand about uh, uh, how we detect in a pregnancy when uh, something's going wrong and help uh, escalate to get good care. I, I have my time in the field. I got to meet uh, the new president uh, and understand what his agenda's like. You know, I'd say that the farm visit may be the most valuable. You know, I didn't grow up on a farm. Uh, you know, some of the basic things about uh, the challenges of farming are, you know, just learning, uh, but to actually see the progress, uh, to see the better seeds, and of course we're just at the beginning of that, uh, to see those hybrid chickens, to see the cows, and to hear from her, you know, her energy, and she's not only doing good work on her farm, she's also what's called a, a village-based advisor, and so she's adopted uh, like 20 of her neighbors, and she shares advice with them as well, and so, you know, getting out the you know, the new weather data information, the price data information, uh, what varieties are available. Um, you know, the digital world uh, actually has application even uh, on, on the farm. Okay, thank you. And so the broad um, context of our conversation is climate change and food security um, and the intersection with young people. Um, but we're also talking as the um, climate change talks, COP27, um, are taking place. Um, you talked about your first career in tech, but you are Bill Gates. Everybody here wants to grow up to be like you, both in terms of wealth and in terms of social impact. And so, uh, am I lying? <laughs> I'm not lying, right. <laughs> and so in terms of guidance to the young people who are so excited to be here with you today, what would you, how, what guidance would you give them in terms of career choices, in terms of responding to the challenges facing humanity today? Well, I think, uh, you know, you're lucky uh, to be a student at a great university. You know, my success, um, although I didn't finish my degree because I was kind of in a rush. Uh, to but get, you would encourage them to finish their degree. I do. Uh, <laughs> You know, unless you have an idea for a total breakthrough company that can't wait, uh, then I th oh, there, there we go. go. Uh, you know, then I think it's it's good to finish your degree. I'm still a student. I mean, I I take more online courses and you know try and understand all the new things, including what's going on uh, in medicine because the foundation does so much work there. I stay. Uh, up to date on uh, computer science because the digital tools are going to be uh, super important. So I think, you know, being curious, uh, learning the sciences, um, you know, so much of the innovation will come uh, from the sciences. And it's great to see Africa with a generation of scientists uh, that will very directly, you know, address uh, the needs that are here. You know, I did not expect to build you know, wildly successful company. Uh, there's a piece of luck in that. But I will say that learning and, and taking your knowledge and seeing it have positive impact on the world, uh, that's been very, very fulfilling, whether it's seeing the software get out or now uh, my work in the foundation uh, in both health and, and agriculture. So, you know, we can all uh, understand today's problems and think about them in a, a new and different way. Okay. Students, we are the hosts here, so as the hosts, we're going to cross over and allow um, our guests to ask the first question to Bill. So, Teresa, you've got some questions. Um, you know, Bill, we have over 10,000 people from 131 countries uh, who've tuned in virtually um, for this conversation. So, Teresa, um, what questions do your students have for Bill? Thank you very much, Kajasi. Hello, Bill. It's nice to see you again. Thank you very much for inviting us to be a part of this and to expand beyond the 
hundreds of people who are in the room there to the 10,000 people who are joining us virtually on the various platforms on Zoom and Facebook, et cetera. So thank you very, very much for allowing us to participate in this event. Um, we've had a lot of questions around innovation. Um, we've had many students from um, kind of the Inspire Institute have asked these questions, as well as the 3,500 kids from Kenya have been focused on agricultural innovation in particular and wanting to understand how agricultural systems can improve the resilience of smallholder farmers to adverse effects of climate change. And they also want to know specifically what the foundation is doing to fund innovations to help grow food security. Yeah, so one of the greatest uh, events in human development uh, is what was called the Green Revolution. And as world population was growing during the 1960s, uh, there was a serious concern that it would lead to hundreds of millions of people starving, basically kind of a Malthusian outcome where population growth would outrun uh, the ability to grow food. And you know, there were people who wrote books who said, hey, you know, this is, uh, there was one called the, the Population Bomb, talked about that. In fact, uh, Norma Borlaug, uh, working down in Mexico to avoid wheat diseases, figured out how to grow uh, what are now called the Green Revolution cereal crops. Uh, he himself worked on wheat, but also maize uh, and later rice and the productivity uh, was more than doubled. And so that actually calories went up uh, during that period where people thought uh, that we'd fall far short. Now we find ourselves again in a challenging situation. You know, we still have population growth, but we also, in addition, have the, the challenge of climate change. And the original Green Revolution was really only for the, the three cereal crops and didn't fully address uh, all of the African ecosystems. Uh, we also know that as we did the Green Revolution, some of the use of fertilizer there uh, did create environmental problems. So, you know, we know that overwhelmingly that was a good thing, but we need a second Green Revolution, uh, this time one that uh, is much more environmentally friendly and that addresses far more crops, particularly uh, for the ecosystems throughout Africa. We're very lucky that plant biology is the same as human biology. So all these tools to do sequencing and understand genetics apply equally well uh, to plants. And so being able to understand how do they resist disease, uh, how do they grow more, uh, even the basic mechanism of photosynthesis and how we might be able to make that more efficient, you know, we have at hand uh, the science uh, to improve agricultural output, even in the face of tough weather. The Gates Foundation does, uh, supports this uh, by funding what we call the CG system. That's the global uh, set of institutions that improve seeds. Norma Borlaug worked in Mexico at CIMIT, uh, actually the head of CIMIT now, because they have a branch uh, here in Nairobi, is based in Nairobi, and I, I met with him yesterday as part of going over to uh, the Kenyan-based agricultural uh, institution, Calro, that's doing great work on uh, both crops and livestock. Uh, and because of getting more resources to the CG system, we have new seeds coming along. Now, we need to do even more. You know, if you, if you, you know, really want to help people avoid climate adaptation, agriculture is uh, the biggest part of that. And so what we should see is a dramatic increase in all agricultural innova 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 innovation. That leads to the next question. Can, can you hear me? That leads to the next question. Okay. Um, which has to do with the place of young people and the second green revolution that you're talking about. And that question comes from Purity. Purity, where are you? Great, can we get the microphones in Purity, please? So Purity, tell us your name and your university. Thank you. We can't hear you, Purity. Um, uh, hello, my name is Purity Jangaya. I'm a student at the University of Nairobi studying computer science. Yeah, my question was about are there uh, climate change projects that uh, involve students? And if there exist such projects, 
how, um, how can students in Kenya, university, university students from Kenya, be involved in such programs? Yeah, so the agriculture, uh, there are many opportunities. For example, now we have satellites uh, giving us relatively constant imagery. We can look at moisture, uh, we can look at plant growth, uh, and we can understand weather systems. So we can understand current conditions, uh, and we can make far better weather forecasts. And we can gather digitally the pricing information. Uh, we also now have ways of using those satellite platforms and looking at the soil uh, to create very accurate soil maps. You know, soil varies a lot from place to place, and so that understanding would tell us what crop we might plant there, what sort of yield we would expect, it would also tell us what sort of fertilizer is required, or even if the soil is um, you know, too basic uh, or too acidic, you, know, you might need to put lime in. And so the, you know, the whole agricultural system you know, will be able to measure what's going on far, far better. You know, for example, when we're trying out a new seed, we can just fly a drone over and see you know, which plants are growing, how quickly are diseases affecting some of those plants. And so you might think, you know, in computer science, okay, that's far away from uh, planting, but putting sensors in the field, doing weather modeling, uh, looking at uh, how things have changed, really looking at the patterns of how temperature affects uh, productivity. You know, we can come up and be a lot smarter uh, using the, the limited resources we have. Okay. Um, there's a question, uh, and the context for that really is that today is Gender Day at COP27, um, and Jeff has a question about inclusivity. And I know that you, Jeff, where are you? He's there. If we could get a microphone to Jeff, thank you. Please go ahead with your question. Okay, all protocols are observed. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jeff Karanja. I'm a student here at the University of Nairobi. And uh, my question is, how does the Gates Foundation ensure inclusivity? Sorry, let me go again. How does the Gates Foundation ensure inclusivity when coming up with policies, technologies, and funding opportunities to promote the needs of grassroots farmers, especially women who suffer the most from climate change? Thank you, Jeff. And so remember, um, COP27, you know, um, gender responsive climate financing, but I believe within the Gates Foundation, you've also started a women's division. So how is that looking after um, women, smallholder farmers? Yeah, so we have a, a dedicated gender group uh, that's one, run by a brilliant uh, woman, Anita Zaidi. Uh, but a lot of the foundation's work, you know, when you work on maternal health, are, are women's anemia, which really affects their health in a very negative way. Those are uh, essentially women's issues. But we're also tracking, you know, so for example, in agriculture, I wouldn't have understood that the crops that women work on are often very different than the crops that the men work on, although there's, there's some overlap. So for example, uh, the work we've done with these high productivity chickens, you know, big eggs, lots of eggs, good health, good meat. Uh, that's mostly women uh, who are, you know, taking those chicken, providing the eggs to their children, going to the market and uh, uh, able to sell uh, some of that output. It, it's, you know, over time, uh, there's a lot of women's health conditions uh, uh, that just haven't had the same level of investment. So our gender group is actually our fastest growing group. We have been lucky in terms of our teams that work on these health issues. They are uh, almost 50-50, uh, you know, as we're giving out fellowships, uh, and granting uh, work. I'd say health is a little bit ahead of agriculture uh, in terms of getting women into the, the key research positions. Um, but even there, you know, we, the world has ambitious goals that I think we'll meet. Given your influence, Bill Gates, what can you do um, to push the uh, to, to, to push the agenda, to push the needle on climate financing, on women 
um, smallholder farmers accessing climate finance. That was the call that came out today, and it was fronted by um, the uh, by Mary Robinson, the former Irish Prime um, uh, President. Yeah, well, uh, one thing I, I'll say that might be a bit disappointing is there is not some gigantic pool of money in the world today called climate finance. Uh, you know, we have these overall aid budgets that are used for, you know, a huge variety of things. Uh, health is a big area. Agricultural is in there, but it actually hasn't been a, a big percentage. In the face of climate, that'll probably have to grow. But there's not a big pool uh, sitting there for climate money. In fact, the aid budgets uh, coming from the rich countries will actually go down uh, somewhat in the years ahead because the Europeans that have been about two-thirds of all the aid, uh, they have a lot of costs uh, coming to them from the Ukrainian war. They're raising their defense budgets. Uh, they're funding Ukrainian refugees. That is considered a form of, uh, of aid. They're subsidizing the increased electricity costs. They're committing to rebuild that country. And so if you take out uh, the war-related aid, um, you know, we're not in a period where we're going to see uh, huge growth. Uh, you know, we experienced this in the Global Fund, you know, which is the group that uh, raises money for HIV, TB, and malaria. Some donors, uh, including the foundation, increased 20 to 30 percent, uh, but we had a few donors come in with significant reduction. So our goal, which was to raise 18 billion, we didn't reach that. So far we've reached only about 15 billion, which is up a tiny bit from three years ago, but not nearly what we'd hoped for. So, you know, a lot of these health and climate solutions are going to have to be very frugal uh, because, you know, even though, you know, I'm the biggest proponent that and meeting with ritual politicians all the time that they should do even more, you know, we're not going to see some gigantic uh, uptick in those amounts. And, and so really innovation and, and spending, spending what aid resources there are, also increasing domestic resources, will be very necessary. Okay, there are a couple of questions around um, agriculture, uh, food production, and support for farmers. I'll start with Lucy Ann, who has a question um, around um, production and the value chain. Lucy Ann, where are you? Thank you. If we could get a microphone to Lucy Ann, please. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lucy Ann Odiero. I'm a fifth year medical student at the University of Nairobi. So, my question is. As the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you have sought to increase farmer production, for instance, by creating the drought-resistant tegumis. So does the foundation's optimization of food production begin and end with production alone, or does it extend beyond that, that is, towards the entire value chain, for instance, including finding markets for the farmer, storing the food, transport, and logistics for the produce, to ensure that the, f the food produced reaches consumers and generates a profit for the farmer? And if so, what key successes and challenges have you encountered? Thank you. Now, it's a, it's a very good point that if you're a subsistence farmer and you're eating a lot of your own output, you know, hopefully this increased productivity is letting you access the market. Uh, and particularly if productivity is going up a lot, you want to be able to take the food from that local community that might not uh, increase its demand and not depress the price by having it go out to other parts of the country, or in many cases, uh, into global export markets. Um, you know, right now, you know, I, I have to say I was stunned when I learned, uh, as we first got into agriculture, that Africa is a net importer of food. You really wouldn't expect that because the land is uh, the least expensive here. Uh, the amount of farming labor is way higher here than the whole rest of the world. Uh, put together, uh, and yet, you know, it's an net importer. And the reason for that is a combination of the low productivity per hectare 
and exactly the point you're making, which is that if there's no roads, you know, it's, very, it's not only hard to get the inputs in, but it's even harder to get the out, output out. You know, I had an a agricultural economist once show me a map that said there's parts of Africa that the transport costs are so high that even if, even if the, the price for, say, the wheat was super low, the cost to get it to the coast uh, would, it still, it would not be competitive on the world market at a very low price. So the importance of finance, you know, infrastructure, making sure the person at the farm gate knows what a fair price is so that, you know, if there's very few people coming to buy their output, you know, should they sell uh, at a particular price or not? And that's one place where the digital phones come in. Uh, road building will still be important uh, to get that, you know, connectivity. Um, and, and so, yes, the opportunity is, is to do what's done uh, with a lot of the cash crops here, coffee, tea, flowers, uh, but not to be such a big importer. You know, so when world food prices go up, it shouldn't be a, a uh, bad news uh, for Africa, although today it, re it really is. And of course, the Ukraine war, not only are food prices going up, but you have fuel, you have fertilizer, all of which are you know, part of that cost structure for the farmer. Well, let me push back on that because there are people who would say that in addition to everything you've outlined, it's also just the historical injustices, you know, in terms of trade systems and international policies that do not favor African farmers and say the way American farmers have traditionally, or European farmers have traditionally uh, uh, enjoyed protection, subsidies, and other legal mechanisms from their own governments. Yeah, I mean, in general, in rich countries, farmers are subsidized. Uh, that's a political reality. I'm not a farmer, uh, and um, but it, it it's a fact that uh, there's some subsidization that takes place there. There have been efforts to you know try to not have that price distortion affect Africa much, and there's only a few crops where it's really made the difference, that is, where Africa could have exported. Uh, but you're right, it's not, uh, there's many unfair things in the world, and that, that's one of them. <laughs> so we have a question, um, and there's several questions like this, um, but these have to do with um, climate change mitigation, action, and historical responsibility. And, um, I will call on Nicole. Nicole? Oh, it is you, Nicole, the super intern. If we could get a mic to Nicole, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Nicole Chapto. I'm a student of uh, public relations and communications management at the University of Nairobi. Um, my question to you is, um, so we know that Climate justice uh, is the simple idea that those who do the most in terms of carbon emissions should um, do the most in terms of uh, giving resources in, in its mitigation. So um, my question is, how does historical responsibility impact on climate change and mitigation as well as um, climate action? Thank you. Well, the, um, just to re review the numbers, which you may all know quite well, the largest historical emitter is the United States. Um, today, the United States is down to about 15% 15 of emissions, although that's still a very big number. If you take the rich countries as a whole, uh, it's about 25% of current emissions. And my view is that the rich countries really have three things uh, that they owe uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, the first is pretty simple. They need uh, to rapidly set an example by driving their emissions to zero. Uh, the sooner they can do that, the better. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it's not likely they'll get there before 2050. A few of them probably won't meet that goal, but that, you know, it's a very serious goal and uh, 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 needs to be uh, done. The second thing is that 
they need to innovate in such a way uh, that for the rest of the countries, that they invent ways of doing all of the climate emitting activities. That includes driving cars, flying planes, uh, making cement, making steel, uh, all these things, uh, they need to use their innovation power to give us a way of doing them so that it doesn't cost extra to do it without emissions. And I term that having the green premium, the extra cost of green cream, to be zero. I believe that that is achievable. Uh, the rich world got a slow start on that. As of 2015 at the Paris Climate Talks, there really hadn't been any discussion of increasing R&D and driving innovation to get rid of those green premiums. Uh, if you have high green premiums, you're gonna get this argument of should the rich countries fund all these green premiums, uh, but because that would be over a trillion dollars a year, it just wouldn't happen. So you've gotta use, it. the way you square that circle is you get use innovation to get those green premiums down. So then you can go to the middle income countries and who are over 65% of emissions now uh, and say, okay, please adopt these innovative practices. We're not asking you to slow down your development because there'd be no possible way to, to justify that. Uh, there might be a little bit of subsidization, but not, uh, not gigantic. And, and the third thing, so it's, it's zero emissions, innovate green premiums to zero. The third thing is uh, both innovating and funding uh, climate uh, adaptation. You know, we use mitigation for the idea of reducing emissions to zero. Took me a while to get used to this because it's kind of funny, they're funny words. Uh, and we use adaptation to talk about minimizing uh, the damage. It's very complicated how you attribute things uh, to uh, climate change. For example, the Sahel drying out is a cyclical thing. Uh, that's happening, that would be happening without climate change. Uh, but, you know, some weather events are caused by climate change. And, you know, so, and weather is immensely complicated. But overall, you know, with climate change, particularly if you're near the equator, although overall you get more rain, you get it sometimes as a flood, sometimes as a drought, and you get these very high temperatures. And high temperatures aren't great for uh, uh, most crops. They're not great for outdoor labor. Uh, there's a lot of uh, negative effects. Cold weather's not good either, but that's not the problem we're dealing with here. So yes, the, there is, in the name of justice, some level of resources should be sent uh, you know, which is basically increasing aid generosity. Uh, there's an even stronger moral case for that before. I think there's always been a moral case for it. You know, if you can save lives for $1,000 per life saved by, you know, getting vaccines out, you know, it's, it's a crime that that isn't done. I want to cross over to the virtual audience, but I want to pick up on something you said before we do that, and that's generosity. You've talked about the responsibility of wealthy countries, and given that most people here want to grow up to be like you, they agreed that when I asked them. Um, what would you say about um, wealthy individuals and responsibility in terms of service, in terms of giving back? Well, wealthy individuals, um, of course, they should make sure that they're uh, paying to get rid of all their emissions. You know, I pay about nine million a year to fund things like direct air capture so that even though I'm doing something that's a bit extravagant, which is flying in a plane, uh, that I make sure those emissions are eliminated. Now that, I, you know, that makes sure I'm not part of the problem, but I also want to be part of the solution, which is why I'm putting billions of dollars into I have an effort called Breakthrough Energy uh, that funds the companies that will come up with those uh, innovations to drive the green premium to zero. For climate mitigation, that's done through the Gates Foundation where you know, funding uh, agricultural innovation, better livestock, all those things happen there. I hope over time we get more philanthropy into the space you know, the rich world governments have a lot more money than all philanthropists put together, but philanthropy can take some of the 
you know, cutting the edge stuff uh, and, and really drive that. And so it's another sector uh, that should come in and, and get involved in a super important cause. Thank you, Bill. Teresa, I will cross over to you and your students. Great. Thank you so much. I think the next Yeah, so fortunately, the good thing about R&D is it, it's often global in nature. You know, when HIV medicines were invented, uh, that was a benefit to all of mankind. Uh, and fortunately, uh, the cost of those, the yearly cost, uh, has been brought down very dramatically. And there is actually, in that one specific case, very generous programs, including U.S. PEPFAR and uh, overall global fund, you know, that's to make sure that we do uh, not just have those available in rich countries. I mean, inequity, you know, inequity has been here before the pandemic and before climate change, uh, you know. But it's been even exacerbated. You no, know, it's been exacerbated, but it, it bothers me when people say, oh, I just noticed there's inequity, and I'm like, wow, where have you been? Uh, obviously, not traveled around a lot. Uh, or you, you, you were on safari. But uh, anyway, um, it, so yes, the argument for justice is very clear. On R&D, uh, you know, it's great that uh, solar panels have gotten very, very cheap. That will continue. Uh, there's ways to double their efficiency without the cost going up. You know, it's great that we've got onshore wind and offshore wind. I'm very hopeful uh, that we make breakthroughs in geothermal. Uh, and Kenya uh, actually happens to be in a great location uh, so that if we can make a breakthrough in geothermal, uh, it would be very advantageous because what we would do is use the wind and solar when that's operating. And then when you have the periods you know, at night or in cloudy conditions, then you would ramp up the geothermal. Because with electricity, you don't just want electricity some of the time. You know, if somebody builds a factory or, uh, you know, you're running a, uh, a process, you want reliable electricity. So I think East Africa, between the hydro resources, geothermal, uh, wind and solar, you know, the R&D is going to get the cost so that you can get your increased electricity, which of course you need dramatically more electricity uh, per person than you have today, um, that it will be achievable to get that in a green way without paying a huge premium. The way this transition is handled, that you know, some countries should be allowed to use their gas resources, that's very complex. You know, rich countries should get rid of all use of hydrocarbons as fast as they can, and most middle income. But, but you know, we're still, we still need hydrocarbons, uh, and you know, should the financing be cut off for that, and how, how do you manage that transition? I'd say that's an area where you know, I, I'd be more on the, the side of, hey, the people who are less than 3% of emissions, you know, we can, the deadlines for them should be very different uh, than for the rest of the world. Appreciate that. Um, we're almost at time, but so, so Teresa, let's squeeze in one more question from your audience.
Well, climate change is a very complex topic. Um, I mean, I, that makes it really interesting. Uh, so we're all gonna have fun <laughs> learning about it. But, you know, it involves weather. Uh, you know, the basic idea is that the carbon is reflecting the heat back down to the surface of the Earth. So you're capturing more and more heat, which is why they call it the greenhouse uh, effect. How much, how quickly we heat up, there's some uncertainty about that. There's a lot of uncertainty about as you heat up, what are the ill effects, you know, and so we have to worry that it could be on the, the, uh, the bad side of that. Of course, we're very adaptable in terms of the plants we crop, we, uh, crops we plant, and things of that nature. You know, ideally, you get enough resources so that things like air conditioning are available. Uh, now, that uses more electricity, which you've got to make sure you're making in a, in a green fashion. There's a lot of great educational material on climate change, and everybody should have you know, some knowledge, because whether you go into health or government policy or you know, helping in the agricultural sector, this is going to be sort of a defining issue uh, of this time. You know, as a young person, you, you can you know, invest in yourself and your own understanding so that you can be uh, part of the solution uh, during, during your working years. They've been told. Um, so look, we're closing, um, and before we go, uh, Bill, I'd like to get your reflections. Um, if there was a magic wand um, with youth at the center of innovation for food security and climate change in Africa, what would this magic wand, what problems would this magic wand solve? Well, one of the great tragedies, uh, you know, I mentioned that we've reduced uh, the world at large has reduced childhood death and cut it in half and uh, down to five million, and, and that I think we can cut it in half again and then cut it in half again. And by the time you do that, you have equity that almost every country is like at 1%. So it doesn't matter where you're born, you're not at some huge additional risk. Uh, you know, so that would be a wonderful milestone. The thing I didn't talk about, which does touch on climate change, is nutrition. Uh, and so in many countries in Africa, over 30% of the children, uh, when they grow up, because of uh, food deficits that they had growing up, neither their full mental capabilities or their physical capabilities are developed. And that's an unbelievable tragedy. You know, I once said if I had a wand and they, somebody said I could cure any disease, I sort of surprised them by not picking you know, HIV or uh, whatever. I picked malnutrition um, and because you know, it, 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 it destroys so much human potential. And fortunately, we are making great progress by looking at the microbiome and understanding, okay, what happens in terms of the gut inflammation that causes kids to get off that growth path? And you know, they're understanding it. Uh, when I was over at uh, Camry, we were looking at the trials that are being done of literally altering the microbiome in a way uh, that you don't get that malnutrition. So, you know, my wish list is pretty long, but I think, uh, you know, doubling photosynthetic efficiency to get crop productivity might make it up to number two. You know, clean uh, source of 24-hour energy like cheap uh, fusion, although that's maybe a long way off. I've got a pretty pretty big wishes, but I guess I'd, I'd put malnutrition right at the top. Thank you. And so look, um, we're at the end of this, but not quite. So I'd like to thank you all for your very thoughtful and insightful